Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for braving the heat and the sunshine, which we should be grateful for, but it's a little much today. Um, uh, but glad you can uh, come over here to the Museum of Danish America and join us for a brown bag lunch. My name is Tova Brandt. I'm on the staff here at the museum as the Albert Ravenwald Curator of Danish American Culture. And it's my pleasure to welcome you all here today uh, to our July program. Uh, brown bag lunch programs are a monthly series. Uh, we try to bring different topics related to the museum's mission, and this month is no exception, um, so we look forward to starting that. But first, I'm gonna tell you about next month's program. <laughs> um, uh, you'll see on your tables that we put out some flyers uh, about a very exciting project um, that we just uh, received funding from the Iowa Arts Council to pursue. Um, we are bringing the uh, artist Annie home. She was featured a few years ago here in a solo exhibition. She's a, um, a conceptual artist from West Chicago and is herself a Danish immigrant. And so we're bringing her back to do an artist in residency to both assemble a piece right here, um, probably in the lobby of the museum, and then install it um, uh, and in our new core exhibition. So this is going to be a new piece of work called Assimilatus Mobilis. Mo mobilis, yes. Um, and she also is welcoming volunteers to help assemble the pieces and put this piece together. If you're a quilter, if you're a sewer, if you know how to hold a scissors, Really, no special skill set is required, but all are invited to come and and spend some time um, learning about the piece, chatting with Annie, and helping out as as many pieces of what used to be Danish Brotherhood ribbons, which are shaped like Danish flags, are sewn to pieces of fabric that themselves together would make an American flag. And so, uh, back to back, these pieces will basically create an American flag on one side and many, many Danish flags on the other. And as a mobile, they will move and twist and, and turn um, all together. So we invite you to come and help create that artwork. And we also invite you all to come here, Annie, as our next Brown Bang Lunch speaker. She'll talk about this work and about others that she's done in her career. That will be on Thursday, August 17th, again at 12 noon. Um, all are welcome, and so it should be a really interesting talk um, about a work that we can watch come together. This, uh, this program today, Denmark the Sat, or Occupied Denmark, um, is a presentation by one of our own um, Danish graduate student interns, uh, funded by the Scan Design Foundation. Um, uh, most of you have, have had a chance to meet Martin, even work with Martin, um, as he's been spending the last several months down at the Genealogy Center, uh, doing some wonderful work in the collections there, uh, working on translations and archival research, and has been a wonderful addition to our staff team here since, uh, since the early part of this year. We will be sad to see him go, as we are always sad to see our, our interns go, but we are thrilled that we get, we get a final big uh, moment of Martin here today as he presents um, one of the topics that he's particularly interested in, which is the years of occupation of Denmark during World War II. So with that, I will introduce Martin. Thank you, Tor. And on that figurative function, I'll just jump right in, I think. Uh, I'll try my best to uh, speak loud and clear, but if anyone's having any trouble hearing me, just holler, and I'll um, try to be a bit more clear. Um, Denmark was occupied by uh, Nazi Germany on April 9th, uh, 1940. Um, the actual fighting that went on was scattered and uncoordinated uh, and was over with in a matter of a couple of hours. Um, the government quickly decided to order the surrender facing the threat of an immediate aerial bombardment of our capital city of Copenhagen, which I'll just show you on the map is, by the way, um, the strategic, can you speak to the microphone? Yeah. 
thank you. Um, the strategic goal of um, occupying Denmark was to get access to the uh, railway lines in uh, Jutland. Here, from down the border all the way up. Um, really, the goal for Germany and occupying Denmark was to get quick access to Norway. Uh, Norway had, or has, a strategic um, seaports that give access to the Atlantic seaboard. Also, it gave them access to quickly transport um, Swedish iron ore from, uh, yeah, from Sweden through the port of Narvik, and that was vital to, to their war effort. Um, so a lot of people in Denmark think that Denmark was like a goal of occupation in its, in its own right, but it wasn't. Um, and that's going to pin a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Daily life, of course, um, changed quite a bit. Um, the first and very notable thing that would sort of carry on through the rest of the occupation was there was an increased in, um, interest in Danishness. Um, that was growing and there was an interest and a need really to express it in, in cultural life and public life. Um, and it was quite spontaneous too. Um, it had a uh, political dimension and a cultural dimension. Um, after France fell, people started to realize this was not going to be a short thing. This was going to be a lengthy occupation. So focusing on Danish core values and Danish cultural values was a way of preserving a national identity in the face of, of, of Nazi occupation. Um, the cultural dimension of it included um, an increased focus on the uh, song legacy, on national cultural symbols, and the political dimension, which came on later, focused very uh, specifically on education about Danish democracy and democratic values. Um, throughout the collaboration policy, which I'll return to in just a moment, um, Denmark experienced some of the highest general living standards of any German-occupied country at the time. Uh, but that doesn't mean there wasn't changes uh, or consequences of the occupation. Um, there was an initial spike in unemployment. Um, that turned quickly, however, as the Germans started to build fortifications on the west coast of Jutland, um, employing Danish workers. There were uh, shortages and rationing to um, a lot of basic things like spices, salt, pepper, sugar, uh, rubber tire, uh, a tire rubber, sorry, coffee, it, things like that were rationed um, well into the 50s in some cases. Um, the Germans. Um, really used the Danish National Bank to fund their works in Denmark. So a lot of the um, other fortifications that were built from the West Coast were funded by were funded with Danish money. Um, there was a promise from the German, German government that the National Bank would be reimbursed for it later, but that didn't happen. So after the war, Denmark was left with quite a significant amount of, of debt. And now the uh, Samovac Politik and the collaboration policy that I just mentioned. Um, it's a term we use to refer to the sort of particular dynamics of how the Danish government worked with the German government, which itself is quite unique. It was the only place in German-occupied Europe at the time that the relations between the two countries took place between two principally independent countries and independent governments. Now, of course, Denmark was under a significant amount of pressure and the Germans were more or less free to, 
just point a gun to Copenhagen and say, hey, you know what? We don't do what we want. But still, there was a, a quite a significant degree of, of independence at the time. Um, the Danish politicians were motivated to collaborate with the Germans through a wish of sparing the Danish population as much as possible from the uh, shortages and the lags and the issues other, other countries faced. Uh, they didn't have to look further than France to see how, or Norway for that matter, to see how far things could go if the Germans would meet a Kalashnikov uh, government. They also tried to avoid being simply replaced by a Nazi puppet uh, government. It was successful in the sense that, as I mentioned earlier, Denmark was largely spared from a lot of the things that happened elsewhere, a lot of uh, bombings and things that didn't take place in Denmark. But after the war, and even during the war in some cases, it was wi widely uh, criticized for being morally uh, reprehensible. Um, the Germans, of course, had interest in the collaboration policy because, as I, again, as I mentioned earlier, Denmark wasn't the actual target. So they just wanted an occupation that could be managed with as few troops and as little effort as it was possible. Uh, so that was their end. Um, when they invaded Denmark, they, the, the, that target was to place Denmark under military protection from the British. Um, Danish politicians quite truly used that to say, you know, if you're here for military protection, then why not work with us? Which they did, and uh, spared us a great deal of headache. Um, the collaboration policy eventually came under increasing pressure as the time of war started to turn, and it would eventually collapse in 1943, and uh, I think this my next slide. Um, in August of 1943, um, there was a series of strikes and sabotage actions um, all across the country, <coughs> primarily in uh, large apartment towns. Um, this rebellion had its background in a series of sabotage strikes by the Danish resistance movement uh, the Germans, who were being increasingly pressured on all fronts, wanted to stem the tide of, of a growing, more active resistance. So they set about a series of um, countermeasures uh, to try to end the resistance or quell resistance. This resulted in a series of strikes across the country where people got on the barricades or fights and shootings in the streets, and things spiraled out of control really quickly. Uh, people all over the country by this time, in August 1943, had a sense that the war would be over soon. Um, as we know now, that's not the case, but still, it fed the, the notion that something more should be done, and it was about time. The time was right to up the level of, of, of resistance. So more people got involved. Uh, there was an increasing amount of uh, sabotage, and the um, main goals were uh, railway lines used by the Germans, but also uh, German-friendly businesses, or businesses that worked with, with the Germans. Um, in Berlin, the, the political leadership, of course, was not satisfied with this development. Um, and Werner Best, who was the head of the, uh, the occupying forces in Denmark, got called back to Berlin. He was sent back shortly after with a series of demands for the Danish government that included uh, nightly curfews, uh, ban on clouds, ban on large meetings, and more significantly, a death penalty be put in place for, um, for sabotage. The government took uh, these demands to 
their constituent parties, who all across the board declined. So the government was forced to take this decline to the Germans. And this resulted in the fact that the government, the parliament, and the crown simply ceased to function. They didn't step back as such, they simply ceased to operate. Um, and that is a legal and political mess I must even try to get into today. But uh, the bottom line is that after they step back, um, their role was taken over by the heads of their respective government departments in the so-called Department of Shapes too. And that lasted until the end of the war, by the end of the occupation. The August Rebellion, and Vanipest, who was, again was the head of the occupying forces, sent a telegram to, uh, to Berlin to say that the time is now tuned to strike against the Danish Jews. Um, considering the fact that the relatively good relations that have been going on between the Danish and the German governments was now if we were all flushed down the toilet, it seemed like to them at least a good time to, to move on an issue that had bothered them for years. Um, so Hitler uh, took up on that opportunity and ordered that the Danish Jews be wound up on the night between 1st and 2nd of October that year. Um, but he played a dangerous double game in that he also tipped off the uh, government as such, even if it stepped back, that something was in the, in the making. Was, something was going to happen soon. There was going to be a move on the Danish Jews. So the, the government led the slip to the resistance movement, which was also relatively well organized at this time, that they're coming for the Jews. So the resistance movement quickly organized a uh, large-scale rescue operation. Um, in the course of that month of October, well over 7,000 Danish Jews were essentially hid in homes across the country and then taken by Copenhagen and Elsinore to Sweden. Um, about 500 Danish Jews were caught and as those 52 passed away in um, the in modern day Czechoslovakia. It's quite incredible that it was possible to save that many people in that short amount of time. And I think there are really five factors that are important in how this all could happen. First, of course, is the fact that the Danish population as a whole rallied around Jews. Um, the Jewish population in Denmark at this time was a large, vibrant, well-integrated uh, community. Um, there have been Jews in Denmark at this point for almost 400 years. So they were everyone's friends, co-workers, neighbors, and to a large extent, I don't even think that religion factored into it as much. Um, so people were more indignant that their friends and co-workers and so on are being bound up in the fact that this was a Jewish issue. Um, throughout the 1920s and 30s, especially after the, the, the crash of Starmark in 1929, Denmark had been fairly well off compared to other European countries. So the emotions of anti-Semitism and fascism hadn't really entered mainstream policy. Um, and then I think that's a large factor. <coughs> Secondly, that's a practical issue of how to get how to get the sweet uh, Jews across. Uh, the sailors who used their fishing boats to take 
the, the Jews across the Sweden charge hefty fees for, for their services. Typically, they're charged about three to four times an, uh, an average worker's annual salary. Um, so they were all paid. Of course, there were people who couldn't afford that, some of whom are the ones who end up in inflation. Thirdly, and uh, there is Van Best who I mentioned earlier, his role is sort of ambivalent in all this. Uh, he still had an interest in maintaining a good relationship with the, with the, the heads of the government departments, even if the government had ceased to function. Um, also, it's bad news, even if his politics were reprehensible, he was not a stupid person. In fact, he was highly intelligent. So, at this point, he would have known where the war was going. This could be a way for him to save his hide, if you will. Um, how much of that factors into his decision to let uh, the word slip about the upcoming Jewish um, roundup? We don't know, but it's certainly a factor. Fourth, uh, there is the efficiency of the resistance movement, which I'll return to in a bit. But it was highly organized this time. And in fact, it was just a month away from getting a, I guess you would call it an umbrella organization. Um, and finally, and perhaps most importantly, the willingness of neutral Sweden to even take the Jews in. All these other factors that I've just named were unimportant if, if Sweden hadn't been willing to stick them together. The aftermath of the rescue operation was that more Danes got acquainted with the resistance movement and started to be sympathetic towards it. And consequentially, the number of resistance fighters grew. Also, uh, after the war, it helped to place Denmark squarely on the side of the Allies. But that's another part of lunch right there. And now, um, this is the um, There was no organized resistance, really, until early 1941. Uh, and it was primarily based around the political uh, fringes. They had the, cons the conservatives on the far right and the communists on the far left. Um, and from these early days, there was a fundamental divide on one hand, you had the population, the people who joined the resistance, who were bound by their individual morals, who they were repulsed by the actions of Germany, who thought Nazism was a terrible uh, ideology and it had to be fought in every possible way. On the other side, you had politicians who uh, were responsible to the population as a whole, and so essentially had individual morality on one hand versus the um, protection of, of the population on the other side. Uh, and that divide continue, uh, continued to feed a lot of the resentment that made people join the resistance movement. Um, after uh, Germany invaded the Soviet Union in uh, June of 1941, the Danish Communist Party uh, was banned. And so, from the fall of 1941 until early 1942, the Communist Party would organize um, resistance organizations across the country and then get the organizational framework set up for a lot of the resistance that went on in the following years. Um, they did so based on an equal measure of frustration toward the resistance, or sorry, towards the occupation, and towards the Danish politicians who collaborated. So in their view, the government, the Danish government, was as much a problem as the occupiers. And so essentially, when they published their newspapers and committed their sabotage, there was much fighting the Danish government in the collaboration as it was fighting the occupiers. 
The uh, legal newspaper was the primary tool of assistance in the early days, but as we enter um, 1942, the assistance became more physical, and the amount of sabotage increased. And again, as I mentioned earlier, it was turned both towards uh, businesses that collaborated with the Germans, but also towards the railway lines that were used by the Germans to get back and forth to, to Norway. Um, the appearance and the increase of sabotage it scared the politicians who feared for the future of the collaboration policy and whether they'd be able to maintain being sovereignty in the face of increasing sabotage. So they did all they could to stop it. As we enter 1943, uh, the resistance movement was growing but still in homogenous. So in September of 1943, uh, the Freedom Council, the Freedom was formed as a way for the scattered uh, resistance organizations across the country to gain one voice and one sort of framework to base their operations on. Um, so the goal of the Freedom Council really was to organize and coordinate the resistance across the country. Um, and it quickly resonated with the population uh, who, at this point, had an increasing amount of resentment towards occupiers, but also felt that the moderate tone of the Freedom Council was a large part of their appeal. Um, and this is where the British really come in. Um, British government had, very early in the war, formed the SOE, the, the Special Operations Executive. That was an organization that aided um, with assistance organizations across Europe. Um, with the Freedom Council, they organized the so-called waiting groups, which were resistance fighters that were armed and trained in preparation of an allied invasion in Denmark. This didn't happen, obviously, but there were armed uh, assistance fighters across the country, Brady and William. In early 1944, um, Germany started their uh, counter-terror uh, as a response to increasing Danish sabotage and a more coordinated Danish resistance movement. Um, The goal really was to um, fight sabotage and resistance by getting civilians to turn against it. Uh, the goal was to have counter terror. There was such a high price to pay that eventually the population would turn towards assistance. Um, the targets were buildings and institutions that were significant to, to the Danish population as a whole but also that there were so-called clearing murders, which was pretty much a tool they used to revenge the killing of German soldiers. So for every one, for every 10 German soldiers that were killed either by assistance or by others in Denmark, one Dane, would, Dane civilian would be executed gunned down in the streets, or however they chose to do it. And preferably, it would be a well-known one. Um, so we had, for example, the uh, poet priest Kai Monk, who some of you may know, was, his death was a result of these so-called theory groups. It was carried out by German soldiers, but increasingly also by um, themes who had joined Nazi groups that was founded and started by the German occupiers. In the last years of the occupation, um, crime and dissolution grew rampant across the country. Um, and after the Danish police was 
disarmed and interned in early 1944, um, the Germans started the Hilfspolizei, uh, Help Police, which consisted of things that had previously served the Nazi groups that worked for uh, the German occupiers. Um, and this only um, made the, the disparity between the Danish population and German occupiers even bigger. This uh, Hibu, as it was called, it was put aside, um, focused on fighting sabotage and simply starting random street fights with civilians. Um, and we'll also get into these vendetta like fights with the Danish resistance. Um, as 1944 went on, as increasing uh, crime rates, dissolution, and especially in the bigger cities, um, there were layoffs and supply problems. Because Germany had previously uh, been the main supplier of a lot of Danish industries, now struggled to deliver the goods that Denmark had previously received because of well, the state of Germany that had been bombed to pieces pretty much at this point. Um, civilian train traffic also who are, came to a stop almost because of the, uh, the heavy sabotage on the railway lines. Um, Denmark, though, at this point, is still relatively well organized and well off compared to the rest of, of occupied Europe. <coughs> On uh, May 4th, 1945, the BBC, the British broadcast, announced that the um, German troops in uh, northwestern Germany, Belgium, and Denmark had surrendered. Um, and that the uh, liberation would be effective as of 8 o'clock the next morning. Um, after the war, as I mentioned, at the start, um, Denmark continued to deal with fashion. The last thing that came off fashion staff was coffee, and that happened in 1953. Um, the Hartzucker, um which was the legal persecution of Danes that uh, had collaborated with the German occupiers, started almost immediately. Uh, 30,000 people were interned. 13,000 were imprisoned, and I put a wall number in here, about 46, but it was actually 78 people were executed. The uh, death penalty had been repealed uh, in 1930, but had been retroactively in place to deal with the illegal aftermath of the war. Uh, many of the business people who had profited from their uh, dealings with the Germans um, were essentially forced to pay them back or go to prison. So out of the about 1,000 profiteers who were uh, judged in the courts, most, far the most of them chose to, to pay the money back. Um, yes, I think that was pretty much it. And I figured a bomb shot. I think we'll go to questions. Thank you. Yeah. Mark, you and I have worked with this down in genealogy because I found that dense record one day of an unidentified woman floating in the water. Yeah. So you explained to me some of the backlash against the women who have associated with the German soldiers. Can you tell them what kinds of things they did to them? Well, the whole. Um, immediate aftermath of the occupation, the immediate the like first few days after the, the occupation and it was it was a mess. Uh, people were bound up and shot and uh, the women as you mentioned some, the, uh, the women who were fraternized with German soldiers were called Feldmatas uh, which is literally translates to field matches. <coughs> 
Um, and it says something about how they were viewed at the time. A lot of them were wound up, they had their heads shaven, and they were put in the back of trucks or buses or whatever and driven through town. Um, and so there's a lot of stigmatization about that. Even now, some of the children of, uh, that came from those relationships in Denmark and Norway still continue to, to struggle with their, with their identity um, because it was such a, a statement and has continued to be a statement many years after, for generations. Martin, um, my father's parents lived in, um, in the country. And is it mostly the city people that were affected by all this? Um, yeah, it was certainly. Um, Can you repeat the question? Yeah, um, the question was if the effects of the occupation mainly was on the cities or if it was. Countrywide, it's actually a very good question. Um, the uh, countryside remained largely unaffected by the occupation. Um, I mentioned earlier that the uh, Germans took a lot of industrial and cultural goods from Denmark. So actually, the countryside and the farmers profited quite significantly from. Um, from the occupation. And because Germany wanted to wind in more essentially the skeleton crew, the main bulk of German troops focused on the big cities. So there were large areas of, of agriculture, the agricultural parts of Denmark we could go throughout the war without ever seeing the German soil. Um, and interestingly, uh, in the aftermath of the occupation, um, the term profiteers was very negatively noted, but it was never used about farmers. Um, and I can't think that farmers are ever prosecuted on a large scale for working with the Germans, even though practically every other sector that profited from the occupation saw people being persecuted for that. So, do I have a question? Yeah. What role did the uh, churches and uh, the religions have in the uh, situation? Uh, and, uh, are there three, or what, what are the main churches or religions in Denmark? Um, I don't know if I want to have a question, but just repeat it for good measure. Uh, the question is what role the Danish church played um, during the occupation. Um, there is the uh, Danish Folkekirke, the, the, the Lutheran church, which is the denomination that far the most Danes belong to. Um, the church was the church was a moderate voice that appealed to um, reason and reflection, essentially. So from what I know, and this is not an area that I've worked with very much, but from what I know, the church was not overly excited about the resistance. Um, so they try to be the moderate tone in, in the public debate. Yeah. And again, this is not an area I've worked with extensively, so I don't know too much about it, but I think I'll just, yeah, let's like a general aspect. Yeah. Did you talk about the role of the king, king of Denmark? Yeah, um, the king was a, um, was a united figure. Uh, especially in Copenhagen, where he had very wide around on his horse every morning through, through the city streets. And even as things got more hectic and dangerous, he'd ride around town without any police escort or anything like that, just to show the population that 
by Terry Sansa. He was, the king was hugely popular in, in during, especially after the, the occupation as a, uh, as a uniting figure. People, there's this fantastic photograph, and I almost regret I didn't include it in my PowerPoint, of the king riding his horse and just two beings just walking up to him, walking beside him. There weren't police or anything like that. They were just beings who were happy to see him out and about. And so people got close to the king, uh, metaphorically and physically even in some cases. So he was he was united and remained so throughout uh, throughout the occupation. Mark, was any of your family involved in any of this? Your met your grandparents or Um I think as time's gone on, um, the generation that was involved with existence has become increasingly reluctant to, to talk about it. Um, so honestly, I don't know if I have any fact that that was that was directly involved. Um, I think my grandparents would, would have been too young at that point to, to be involved in anything, but other than that, I don't know. I know a lot of people don't. Uh, it's very common now in Denmark to see people who are clearing apartments and houses, attics from, from grandparents and grandparents and finding things that will lead to the assistance movement and people had no idea um, that whichever family member they're, they're clearing the, the, the house from was even involved. Um, that's been a very common occurrence. But to answer your question, no, I don't think I have any family that's been involved. Imagine it's it was similar. Um, I could imagine it could be a, a, a simply an issue of, of like border politics and the sense of national belonging in that area, which has been heavily contested. Um, it has been a hot button for, for many years, and I imagine it still was at the time. Uh, there were parts of what we now call Sunni that was at least on paper, German until 1920. So, and the occupation logically started 20 years later, so it would still be, it could still be a, a, a hot talk in that respect. And I imagine that might be an part of the explanation, but other than that, I don't know. For a long time, uh, Germany would send um, resources to Denmark and then take and have them processed in Denmark and then take them back. And also, a lot of the agricultural products, industrial products, uh, would be produced in Denmark and then shipped to Germany um, for their use. So things like um, corn and butter and meats and dairy products would be bought by the Germans. Um, and the reason I sort of say bought is that, as I mentioned at the start, the way it worked was that the Germans, when they invaded, set up what they called a clearing account with the Danish National Bank. The Danish National Bank then paid essentially for products 
that the Germans took out of the Danish industries, including agriculture, promising to pay the money back later, um, except it didn't. Um, so essentially, it's like any other transaction, except, yeah, there was uh, no actual money involved other than Danish money. Yeah, does that answer your question? How much did they owe that money at the end of the occupation? Or do you have a number for that? I can't remember, but it's... Uh, I seem to remember it was about something to the effect of like 80 or 90 million dollars. Mm. Which is a lot of money even by today's standards. But and that's why I talked about that being a big problem after the war, because obviously, you know, we don't see that money again. So, yeah. That is a uh, whole hot mess that I'm not sure I want to get into. Uh, that is, yeah. But trust me, no offense, but you don't want to be starting. We'll leave that for another bomb back lunch. Yeah. Yeah. Back to our own civil war here. There are still, uh, there's still issues with the South, you know, from back from our civil war. And so I wonder, like, you know, when I've been in Europe, I didn't notice anything, but. No, I don't think there is any sort of uh, resentment today. I mean, generations have passed, and more of those ties have been forged uh, in relations between the European Union and through. NATO and so on. So. And maybe because it was just like mostly Hitler and you know that. I think yeah, not Germany is. Like yeah, Germany has definitely done a lot to, to uh, sort of reflect on their historic legacy in that respect. So I think you might still find some, obviously some resistance fighters and others who. I'm not exactly fond of, of, of Germany, but generally, you know, that will be individual cases. Generally, there's no antagonism or anything like that today. And besides, you know, this point, it's not, it's not the first time we got a certain body part handed to us by the Germans. I mean, it's, it's, yeah, it's just, yeah. Anyway. Thank you, Martin.